Now we are going to go on in our adventure with design patterns and in particular we are going to tackle the factory design pattern. But before we do that, I wanted to show you some little modification that I've done to my example project. And uh, also we will discuss in this video what is not really a design pattern, but uh, it's more like uh, what it's called an idiom, the simple factory idiom. And they probably uh, want to ask me, well, we are going to talk about this if this is a series on design pattern. Well, it's because uh, this idiom is actually very widely used and uh, I think it's propedeutic, it's very useful if you want to understand uh, more easily the factory design patterns. So, let's say what I've changed in this project. As you see, I have um, added a few directories uh, because I've added some class and, and I have reorganized them. So here inside Creational Singleton, we still have our Highlander, uh, um, <laughs> we still have our Lazy Highlander, but um, I have added a few more classes and a few more directories. In particular, since we're going to discuss uh, the creation of different families of objects, I had to create a few dummy objects uh, to construct these families. And uh, um, I hope you like my <laughs> approach here. Um, so I have here in the directory common, I have two abstraction basically. That means they could be interfaces, they could, they could be as they are actually abstract classes. When we call it about abstraction, we usually mean the the source of the of a family of uh, inheritance or implementation. If you know enough about polymorphism, you know how important it is to program by interfaces, that is, to use as our uh, type for the references that we use uh, as input to function, as type of return from functions, etc., um, to use um, interfaces, uh, actually abstraction to use abstractions for these uh, types. And if you're not sure um, about what I'm talking about right now, uh, maybe you want to go and see some tutorial about polymorphism and especially not really the, the technical detail, but why it's important, why we do polymorphism. So here you see I have this, uh, you know, I'm Italian, I couldn't help this uh, <laughs> to make this kind of example. Uh, I think it's uh, actually a little nice, funny toy example. We have an abstract class, it's called pasta, the mother of all pastas, of course. And we can specify um, how we want this pasta, with what condiment, if it's freshly made pasta, which is a concept that I don't really know if you American uh, know about. That's pretty much it. There's only one abstract method that I had to make just to, just so that the fact that this is an abstract class made a little sense, even if it's just a toy example. So I provided this abstract void cook. And then here we have uh, another class, uh, very, um, still very simple, just a little bit more involved than the, the pasta that, I, that we have already, that you have just seen. And as you can see, pizza is also abstract. Uh, it has a list of toppings, of course, uh, and I can specify these toppings, these toppings here in the constructor. You see, this takes uh, substantially. You see, this takes uh, a var arcs, basically. That means uh, I can pass to this constructor a few strings. How many? Um, how many strings I want? I don't have to actually take the trouble of um, putting them in an array, and that's the meaning of these params. Um, keyword if you didn't know about it. So in the constructor I initialize my string, I add my toppings, and as you see, just to make it, I mean, it's not realistic at all, but just to make it not too simple, just to make it uh, a little bit more decent, I've added uh, this uh, topping method and this toppings property that returns the toppings, but as you see, it returns them uh, as an instance of i enumerable, not as a list, notwithstanding the fact that they, they actually, the toppings inside this pizza are in a list. But, you know, why give this information to the exterior world if you don't need it? It's better, as I said before, to be programming by interfaces. So here is the implementation of the cook and the slice method, very interesting implementation as you see, and uh, finally also we have uh, one abstract method just to uh, 
make it a little bit more, uh, I wouldn't say interesting, but need, and not even realistic, but you know, just to uh, make a little bit more sense of this abstract class. And of course, we have our implementation. And um, so here we have the, under the Italian namespace and directory, we have a wonderful uh, Italian implementation that is uh, ravioli. This is kind of the old fleshly made pasta, which is one of my favorite, especially with the two cool souls uh, from my um, region of adoption, Liguria. And uh, then we have uh, another another extension of pasta, which is carbonara, made with uovo e guanciale. And uh, of course, it's another of my favorites. And we also have uh, the two implementation for uh, two pizzas. Uh, great classics, margherita with mozzarella e pomodoro and uh, um, capricciosa with mozzarella, pomodoro, olive nere, prosciutto cotto, carciofini. As you see here, I'm just uh, calling the superclass constructor with some specified uh, toppings. And of course, since uh, I've lived in the States and also I assume that uh, quite a bit of, of, of the people who will be watching these tutorials are either American or have some experience with American food. Here's, uh, here, are the, here are the American implementation of um, pasta and pizza. And you probably can figure out that I'm not really a fan of uh, Italian-American uh, um, cuisine. Like for example, for this implementation of pasta, spaghetti meatballs, which of course does not exist in Italy, but it's considered Italian food in the States. And here you see, I just use as a condiment uh, my huge meatballs, and this is not freshly made pasta, of course. And um, of course, how could we have uh, made it without the fettuccine Alfredo, which is actually the iconic uh, Italian um, food that you can see in the state that nobody in Italy ever dreams about eating. Uh, I don't know if you know about the, the history about this. The history of Fettuccine Alfredo is that uh, basically someday an Italian guy made some pasta just with Parmesan uh, and uh, butter, which is what we do when we are sick, you know, when we have to fight diarrhea. And uh, by, by accident, some, I think some Americans noticed it, liked it, and thought it was a very, um, thought that it was a very characteristic and interesting uh, dish, so they imported to the States. And now um, you can be proud to have everywhere in the States uh, as pasta what Italians eat when they are sick. So, we also have, of course, uh, two pizzas here, pepperoni pizza and uh, um, Hawaiian pizza, you know, just to be a little bit more, um, and you know, Hawaiian pizza to be a little bit more exotic. So I'm not going to use all these classes at once, but I've, I've prepared them so that you don't have to get bored uh, seeing me type all this, uh, all this stuff uh, and, and so that my comments about cuisine can be minimized in uh, five minutes uh, and no more. But uh, I also want to discuss this other project that I've added to my solution. This project is actually a test project. This is probably the second thing that I'm more fixated about, other than Italian cuisine, that is doing unit testing. Um, I am very well known for harassing my students all the time about uh, doing tests, doing tests, doing tests, because I think they're so important and they're very much uh, misused and misunderstood. Anyway, this is just uh, a class library project that I've added to my solution. So nothing fancy. I want to use XUnit here. So it's not the classic um, test project that you can do using MS test, just a class library. And of course, I have added to this class library the library for XUnit. So what I did is just basically use uh, NuGet. And um, as you see, I've added XUnit. The library that you need uh, um, to add is actually XUnit. Uh, and then you also need um, XUnit uh, Visual Studio Runner. And that's because, uh, of course, we want to um, let Visual Studio be able to integrate with, um, with XUnit. So basically, you need this guy here and this guy here.
So, why we use this? Uh, we use this because uh, doing a little experimentation inside the main me inside the main method uh, is not very is not the most intelligent way to um, test that our program is behaving as we hope. So, as you see, what I've added for uh, up to this point to this test project is just uh, one class that I call singleton test, and uh, this class, as you see, has this one method which is marked by the attribute fact. Fact comes from uh, XUnit, and it marks this method as, uh, as a unit test method, so it will be executed uh, um, when I launch my tests. And as you see, what we are doing now is just testing that the singleton works as we expect. That is, if we call uh, more than one times instance of the Highlander class, what we get is the same object. So this assert same is just verifying that um, sing1 and sing2 are two references that point to the same object. Not extremely um, intriguing for now, but uh, uh, it will be useful later to make a few tests just to verify that things are going as we expect. And, you know, as I just wanted to take also the chance uh, to remind you of, of how useful and uh, important uh, unit tests are. So, as I was saying before, I wanted to talk uh, about what is called the um, simple factory idiom. That is, oh, let's say that in the software that we're writing, we have uh, different kind of pizzas or pastas that we have to deal with. And in the good spirit of polymorphism and programming by interfaces, we want our program to be able to reason about pasta and pizza just in terms of the uh, interfaces or abstract class that represent these, uh, these abstract types. But, well, at some point we have to instantiate uh, the object. And to instantiate the object, we actually have to make a choice and we have to reveal the implementation that we are using uh, at this point. And that, of course, can be a problem because uh, if all our code is littered with uh, um, calls to one constructor, say because now we want to work with uh, pizza margarita, then what happens when we have to change the pizza? We have to go and hunt for all these references inside the, our software and, and try to change it everywhere so that the invocation to the constructor, the margarita pizza, gets substituted with the invocation to another kind. And that's really a nightmare. So how can we improve this situation? Well, one important rule that we can uh, turn to when we have a problem in object-oriented design is uh, find what varies and isolate it. Because once it's isolated, uh, it's easier to change, basically. So what's changing here? Here's, uh, what's changing is the instantiation, say, of a different kind uh, of pizza. So what we want to do is to create, isolate this in a, a single method of a, of a class that we create exactly for this purpose. So we could go here inside the simple factory directory and add a new class, which we'll call um, simple pizza factory. There we go. Let's make it public. And what we want to do is um, give to this class a method that we will call when we uh, want to create um, some kind of pizza. So let's say for now, let's forget the American, um, let's forget the American pizza. This will uh, will come handy later when we discuss the more complex uh, pattern like uh, factory method and after factory. But uh, usually, this simple pizza factory it's a simple solution to a single problem, as we were saying before. Um, so let's say that we have only the Italian family of food, and in particular that uh, we want to be able now to handle just the creation of uh, pizzas. So we want to give to this um, class a method, and we will call it, um, we'll make it public, of course. And then we have to ask ourselves, what do we want to return here? What, what kind do we want to declare as the return type of this function? And just a little bit of thought will probably convince you that we don't want here pizza margherita or, or capricciosa. We want the abstraction here. So 
this netto is going to return a pizza even if visual studio doesn't want me to because i still have to import the namespace so this will be a button a very original name like uh, create pizza and here i can pass something that will uh, identify the kind of pizza that i want to um, that i want to create uh, i could pass a string maybe a solution that's uh, a little bit more elegant and type safe is to use um, an enumeration so let's say we, um, pizza type and uh, here we we'll say um, margarita and of course a capricciosa there we go so now instead of any string i can make it so that uh, this method uh, create pizza as input takes only one element of the enumeration so this is gonna take uh, a whoops sorry um, this is gonna take a pizza type uh, a pizza type uh, type all right so what we're going to do here you probably have already guessed it's nothing fancy i can do a switch or i can do an if it doesn't uh, it doesn't really matter let's go let's go with let's go with the switch so switch over type and now we have to say all the cases that we want to handle so case margarita um, case pizza type margarita and just don't forget the break and here uh, actually we don't need a break because we want to return so um, return new uh, margarita and of course we have to do the using and then we have another case uh, case pizza type capricciosa boom return new capricciosa and of course we have to say what we're gonna do if we don't have a match on these of and on any of these two types and what we're gonna do um well for now let's say that we want to talk to throw an exception so let's say the argument exception it's a type not um permit. so there we have it um this is all there is to the simple uh, factory idiom uh, it's a common uh, way to deal with uh, just a little bit of variance in the um, implementation uh, of an interface or on the extension of some base class. It has the obvious advantage of being, as you see, very simple, nothing fancy, nothing complicated. But uh, the problem with this approach is that uh, every time uh, I get uh, a new kind of pizza, I have not only to create a new type of pizza, but I have to come here and I have to change the switch and I run the risk of making a mistake, uh, introducing bugs. Uh, and so the situation is better than it was uh, before when i when i didn't have any um, other way of creating pizza and just calling the constructor all over the place uh, in all of my project at least now we have only one place where pizza get created so if there's a change there is only one place uh, where this change happens so we were next pizza we just have to um, change this class that's that's very that's at least for now very simple so as I said, uh, let's not be too academical. If the problem is simple, let's find a simple solution for it. Even if it's a solution that violates uh, what is called the open-closed uh, principle. If you don't know it already, the open-closed principle is a very important fundamental principle of object-oriented design and programming. And it's set, what it says is that uh, your, the code that you write uh, 
should be open for extension but closed for modification which means that we should be able to add new kind of pizzas without having to come here and modify code that already uh, functions well and risking to uh, make it more complicated if not uh, um, erroneous so there we have it um, the simple um, uh, factory idiom not really a design pattern so we cannot be proud of it as uh, our new conquest uh, in the design pattern realm but uh, you will see later that it will help us uh, understand the more complicated uh, um, factory patterns you know better way to learn is just uh, one step at a time